The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. So once again, we are up against the wall of science. I'm spending my time uh, working on the scientific submission for the ALEF conference coming up uh, this summer in Montreal. Uh, so as much as it pains me, I'm not going to talk about uh, that stuff right now. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about how to break ties and achieve synchronization. Uh, um, both at a sort of fairly general level and then get all the way down to the nitty-gritty of intertile events, which is the other task that I have to be working on. I spent about a day and a half uh, plus a little bit on this, and, and they've got some progress to show for it, but I think there's sort of some of the bigger philosophical picture that's important to understand why obvious traditional computer science and computer engineering sp solutions are not the direction that I'm going in. So it, normally when computers are going to talk to each other, uh, you know, you talk by a protocol, a set of rules saying what to do. And the vast majority of protocols that are in use, like the Serial Peripheral Interface, SPI, I call it SPI, uh, um, are designed to have a master and a slave and to make the two roles in the communication channel asymmetric so that it's clear who speaks first, who responds, who does what, and there's no race. There's no wondering about who gets to speak next because the protocol completely spe spe spells it out. And there it is, you know, uh, spy master, spy slave, and so forth. And the vast majority, so token ring is another way of approaching this. This was invented by IBM like 30, 40 years ago. It was used, not used a lot anymore more, but now it's sort of a, a token, a special pattern of bits that was passed around among the machines that are sharing a communications uh, medium, uh, and if you had the ring, you could communicate, I'm sorry, if you had the token, you could communicate, and, you know, this made sense, it did work, it got some use, but it had all these aggravating things, like even if nobody wanted to be communicating except for you, you had to wait for the, the token to come all the way back around to you, and if something went wrong, God forbid, and the token got lost, then... <laughs> The whole communication thing stopped until somebody figured out that the token was gone. Uh, um, USB, I mean, a much more modern one that happens all the time. Uh, you know, you got different, the cables have different connectors on the different ends because you have a USB host and a USB client, a USB host and device. What are their differences? Are they really just the same? No, they're hugely differences. For example, the host initiates all communications on the bus. The host is usually the computer, your phone, whatever it is, and, and the client, the device is, you know, whatever you plug into it. But you plug in a lot of things these days, you know, microphones, cameras, movie cameras and stuff, and they're all devices, and they have to wait for the host to ask them, it's kind of strange, and all that stuff just has to be worked out. These problems of communications order and so forth go way beyond just computers. You know, what should you do the next time that you meet the Queen of England? Uh, only speak when you're spoken to. That is a master-slave communication protocol. Yeah, um, you know, don't sit. She does, and so forth. Now, of course, when I was googling around for this, there was like a, you know on Royal.UK or whatever it says. You know, there are no obligatory codes of behavior when meeting, meeting the Queen. You know, like uh, okay, obligatory and obligatory. Uh, um, but it's the same thing. Uh, I, to make the, uh, everything go smoothly and avoid stepping on each other's toes and make everything seem as respectful as possible to at least one of the people in the thing. Uh, um, but versus that sort of master-slave relationship, the, uh, whoops, the, um, Ethernet in back in computer land is the big thing that at least originally was not that way. Uh, like the token ring, the Ethernet had a shared cable that had a whole bunch of things that were connected to it, and there was no master and no slave, and any of them could speak at any time. And it had this very clever technique originally used called carrier sense multiple access with collision detection that essentially means that when you had something to say, you just sang it out onto the wire, but simultaneously you listened to what the wire was saying, and if you you heard yourself singing, then you knew everything went through fine. Whereas if it comes back garbled, that meant somebody else was trying to sing when you were singing and there's been a collision. Now, and, and that's very clever and it worked quite well and it got Ethernet off of the, uh, out of the box and made it essentially the winner that, you know, it's become that A for, for hard lines. And 
these days everything's been broken down so pretty much every pair of things that are talking have their own specific wire to talk to rather than having lots of device sharing a party line so uh this collision detection business has gone away in full duplex with switches so modern ethernets are completely collision free oh uh, of course that doesn't mean everything is wonderful because there's still the only so much data that you can push through a wire at a given amount of time there it means the arbitrage arbitrage between which packets get to travel th between the switches and so forth still has to be sorted out and things may have to wait so there's no collisions but that doesn't mean everything flows perfectly the internet uh, has the same sort of issue at the next level up the tcp the transmission control protocol is the way that you talk the way that your computer is your phone talks with everything when you go to facebook when you talk make a ip phone call and so forth all of this stuff well almost all of it uh, uh, is going via tcp there's another possibility but and in tcp in order to begin talking there's this thing called the three-way handshake and it says you know the client says you know i would like to talk to you and the sir and, and here's here's my piece of information saying you know my my little sequence number where i'm coming from and the server says i heard you say sequence number x and here is my sequence number y and then for the third part of the handshake the client says i heard you say sequence number y and now we are off to compute to to communicate back and forth and we keep using those numbers that we exchange in the three-way handshake to keep track of what has been received at each end the problem being that you know things take time you can have packets crossing mid-flight it happens all the time and you have to somehow sort this out so you know the 3 way handshake is a, is a clever thing it works very well but you have to understand that you know isn't this like you know the same the whole philosophical those logic puzzles where the you know the natives have blue eyes and green eyes and they have to leave the island if they have green eyes and so forth so it gets into these things i heard you know i know that you heard me and you know that i heard you but you don't know that i know that you you know that I know that you heard me like that. And in fact, you know, people don't think about it because the three-way handshake works, works perfectly well for most cases. But in fact, if you go into it, that yes, we can't actually prove that all the packets got through because that last act, you know, the client is going to send more stuff after that last act, but that last act, it, it doesn't know that the server has received it or not. In fact, you'd have to send an infinite number of sins and acts back and forth. And in fact, TCP kind of does that by using the actual data packets to acknowledge previous ones as it goes forward but it just goes to the show that there is not sort of a permanent 100 percent guaranteed bulletproof solution to this there's just stuff that works well enough and when it comes down to uh, letting things, so, you know, in TCP, it's okay because the client speaks first. It's always the client going to the server saying, you know, I would like, you know, my homepage. I would like to see my email, whatever it is. And the server says, okay, who are you? And off they go. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of cases where there are things can be absolute races that can have absolute ties and you have to have some kind of tiebreaker. Now, in computer science, traditionally, people think, ties are unlikely so they don't matter so for example if you're comparing two numbers to see which which one is bigger you say well if a is bigger than b then do whatever if b is bigger than a then do something else well but what if they're equal so do you let a get it but a and b are supposed to be the same kind of thing why does a get the special little case of when they're equal and, and you know so Right. So tie goes to the runner. That's the sort of idea of it. You know, if in baseball, if the runner is running towards first base and the ball is coming and the, the first baseman catches the ball at the exact same time that the uh, runner tags the base, then the tie goes to the runner. Well, of course, I learned by reading uh, up for this video that the umpires say, no, 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 that's not true. Uh, uh, strictly speaking, there is no tie. You know, either the ball hit the glove first or the, the foot, the toe hit the, pa the bag first. First, and whichever that one is, that's the correct call. And, you know, I understand how it seems to make, to make sense to go with that, you know, that it, there's no uh, official reason to admit that the world is fuzzy and that all the way down at the femtoseconds and quarks and whatever, you'd figure, you know, well, one of them must have happened before the other one. But if you go down that road, it has all kinds of bad effects. And the one that comes to mind for me is this idea of high frequency trading. And there's, you know, there's lots of different forms of high frequency trading, but one in particular is called low latency strategies. And the idea is if you can get your 
bids, if you can get your orders into the stock exchange ahead of somebody else, you can make money. If you both have access to the same information, but you can react first, then wow, uh, you get the, you get the good price and the next guy gets the price that's already been jacked up by your order. Uh, um, and people have been gone crazy with this, you know, using microwaves versus wires because it's faster and building buildings right next to the stock exchange to have the minimum amount of wire to do it and so forth. And, you know, this strikes people as, you know, how is this really fair? And, you know, in a big sense, it isn't. And it leads to this, you know, the new standard for price. This looks like an ad for, uh, you know, a rack mounted 3D printer of some sort. No, it's not. Uh, uh, this is three spools of fiber optics that compile that together they're just hooked together so that it's something like you know 38 miles 36 miles I'm not sure a ton of fiber optic cables and a stock exchange a particular stock exchange the IEX the investors exchange takes all of the communications coming to their stock exchange and routes it through these dozens of miles of fiber optics deliberately to slow it down now that doesn't change the order of how they come in they arrive in as all oh, those things go zipping and zipping and zipping they pop out again the other side but what it does is it means uh, if you're racing with the outside world and some tiny little amount makes a difference at the exchange well then the information will be stale by the time it pops out the other end of this magic box and in fact uh, they now have data the intentional access delays make the IEX a fair exchange this particular paper did a bunch of studies on it so going as fast as you can not admitting that you need to break ties somehow that you can't just leave it up to the physics and expect things to come out right is the takeaway method message and, and you know in computer science you see these all of these things in specs and program stuff saying break ties arbitrarily ties are broken arbitrarily and what that really just means is you're not taking responsibility for the consequences of breaking ties one way versus the other. And for computers, for typical computers, lots of times it doesn't matter. But for adaptive systems, it often matters. And this is what I see over and over again in artificial life and uh, living computation systems, that they will evolve to get right there at the edge. You know, it's like you'd rather win the auction by one penny rather than a million dollars. And if you're engaged in, ac in auctions over and over and over again, you'll hone in on being that B being that A guy versus that B guy and getting the floating point number that has one more thing in the 16th digit so that you can win for the cheapest price. And again, that's just like the f high frequency trading. It's no more fair here than it is there. And in our systems, it causes all kinds of strange behaviors where, you know, your creatures tend to move up and to the left of the screen. Why? Because you view, you visited all the sites that they uh, were getting updated in a fixed order, which was breaking ties arbitrarily and again it's not arbitrary if you say it's arbitrary it means someone else knows what it is and you don't so this is where we were our t2 tiles are all completely symmetric there's no reason to say one should be the master and one should be the slave and you might say okay well you know i'll make west northwest and northeast be masters and southwest southeast and east be slaves done they all match up that way it'll be one master and one slave but it isn't because now if we haven't got a guy to our northwest we have no master but we still need to communicate with other folks and so forth and furthermore if you're the master you have this little bit of edge because you get to speak first you get your stuff to ship through and it's really really hard to wipe that out so the goal of the intertile event sequencing is all about how to get this going without resorting to those simple-minded master-slave relationships uh, um, and so the way I'm doing it is I'm making these levels there's the initialization level there's the level when we've discovered we're doing MFM and we have compatible MFZ files and then there's that we're actually doing events and so forth and what I'm mostly focused on and the stuff that I've worked on this week was the first levels getting it up in a, a systematic way and it's starting to look okay so we have three levels and in each level we have three stages when we first got in we are here but we're waiting to hear that the other person is here now we're in the stable position we are here and we've heard that you are here as well and then when the world changes on the state of the tiles so that we're ready to move on we go to the third stage saying I'm ready to move on to the next level but I haven't heard that you are and as soon as I hear that you are then we move on to the first stage of the next level and it works 
works pretty well. Uh, um, oops, all right. Uh, so here it is. So this is another Curses Simulator. Uh, uh, now we've got the, the tiles have been sort of shrunk down because they're not so important, but the intertile connector. So this is the west connector for the tile A guy. This is the east, east connector for the tile B guy. And then we have two actual channels in between them. And so if we let this thing run, uh, what happens is the ITCs gradually start to build up the stack. The first step is init enter, and then when they realize that both sides are in init enter, they move on to init stable, and then they're going to move on to init exitable once their tile has started running in MFC. Oh, so in this case, we lucked out. Tile A and tile B are both running MFZ zero, so those are compatible, so we should get all the way up to compatible, to compatible enter, and we should get to compatible stable and, and there we are and so that's a case where it all worked great now I've designed these tiles so they completely randomly shut down and start up other MFC's at various times so, so I won't take a lot of time to look at this but well, we can speed it up uh, um, until somebody screws up uh, uh, alright so that's alright so now we have uh, what do we have no, we're not. Uh, okay, so there it is. Now we have MFZ1 versus uh, uh, MFZ0. So tile A is running MFZ1. Tile A is running MFZ1. And tile B is running MFZ0. And now they're stuck at init exitable like that and you know they some they will send redundant packets if the if, because things may cross in the mail if everything works out right and the timing gets all set about right it'll actually be fairly efficient one guy will go the other one will respond and they'll move on uh, uh, but it'll be much more robust and I'm feeling pretty good about how this shape is shaping up so I need to, to polish this up more and and clean up the code to then use it as a model for going back to the C++ code and that's what I would really like to get to the point of this coming week we shall see all right uh, um, so four more weeks in the wall of science sequencing intertile events the sequencing is coming along hope to have more next week thanks for being here you have a good week hope to see you next week